In the last episode, we explored the well-known narrative of ancient Rome, a civilization that allegedly left a monumental impact on the world. Hollywood and history books reinforce this story. But, is it all true? Jernigius's book, Dear Realit at Der Omission Reichs, questions many aspects of this narrative. He challenges the belief that Romans built roads during warfare, crossing mountainous terrain without existing infrastructure, and asks how such feats could have been achieved without sufficient manpower. Gius even suggests that the Celts, not the Romans, built many of the roads that history credits to Rome. Gius also points out that many Roman soldiers were actually Celts, Germans, and Gauls, the very people they were supposedly conquering. This raises doubts about the authenticity of Rome as a singular empire. He asserts that Roman was more of a profession within Celtic society, related to military duties, rather than a distinct national identity. Interestingly, Gia suggests that many artifacts attributed to Romans could just as easily have been created by the Celts, Greeks, or other ancient cultures. He further claims that the title Caesar has German roots, linking it to a larger Iberian Celtic Germanic Empire, not solely Rome. Finally, Gius highlights that many cities across Europe, including Trier in Germany, were once called Rome, with little connection to the city we know today. This broader definition of Rome as military bases challenges the idea of a centralized Roman Empire. Could the Rome of history merely be a convenient fiction? Anyway, this is part 3 of the series, the final part. If you feel like you've missed anything, check out the previous videos, the links are in the description. I recommend watching them all, to get the full picture. I hope you don't get bored. So, without further ado, fasten your pants and let's get started. The Limes The Limes is the name given to a defense, border, wall and tower system, denoting the supposed Germanic borders of the Roman Empire. As learned in history class, the southern side of the Limes was Roman, and the other side was enemy territory, or non-Roman, the barbaric hordes. Gia spends a lot of time debunking the notion of the Limes being the border of the empire. I won't recount all of his points here, but one of them is that Roman artifacts and architecture were dug out on both sides of the wall. Moreover, cities of the Roman Empire were stationed on both sides. I too have wondered why an ever-expanding empire would suddenly build a fixed border like this. Gia sees the wall and its accompanying towers as either a toll system to collect money from travelers or a Celtic long-distance communication system. There is no evidence for a historian named Tacitus. One of our primary sources of information on ancient Rome is the writer Tacitus. Without Tacitus, we know almost nothing about ancient Rome. Gius claims that Tacitus' writings are a hoax, created by the Catholic Church to justify their history. By creating a fake history after a cataclysmic event, the Catholics cemented their power. I looked up the name on Wikipedia, and found that they seemed to have no problem with his name. Until further down on the page, I read this. The title presents his first name, but the small print says his first name is not known. Always when researching fabricated history, it pays off to have attention that spans beyond the first paragraph. Gius also notes that nobody knows when or even where Tacitus was born, nor when or where he died. That's not very reassuring for a figure we base a large chunk of history on. His first name isn't known for certain, nor anyone he is related to. Even so, he is claimed to be an eyewitness of events spanning much more than only one lifespan. He not only describes wars, battles and Roman victories over those barbarians in great detail, but also goes into local fist fights, as if he were personally present. One sign that at least some of his writing may have been made up. He describes every tool and weapon in detail, countless conversations and interpersonal issues, etc. His writing titled Germania suddenly appears in the 15th century. Before that, it was unknown. It purports to describe what happened in the year 190 BC. The manuscript appeared in the monastery of Corvi in western Germany. It's strange that these accounts of Roman history were unknown for 1500 years, only to suddenly appear and form our understanding of history. This could point to a forgery. There are many more rabbit holes in Jesus' book that I haven't had the leisure to go down. For example. The dark ages of the medieval times did not exist they were invented as phantom time. At least 300 years were added. Others say 1300 years are fabricated. 
1633 book by Chatelius, says that the Celtic language was brought to Europe after the Babylonian language confusion from Iraq by the Essenes tribe. The book sees the Essenes as the father of the Germanic people, today known as Ashkenazi Jews. In 1691, an author by the name of Spaten said that Rome was in 3212 of the Jewish calendar, which would be our year 1212. This completes my summary of the book. To keep things in perspective, I don't know enough about the subject to either verify or debunk anything it says. I add it to this channel as a starting point for further research. The following are some more of my own thoughts on the subject. Atlantis and the Celts one of the first clues that the Germans were perhaps not the enemies of Rome was, in what Germans were called in Latin. Alamant, which is simply ancient German for all men. Is this really a name you'd give to your enemies? If we go by DNA research, the Gauls, the Gallic people, and the Gaelic people of Ireland, were the same. Looking at the words Gallic and Gaelic, it makes sense, right? Both the Gauls and the Gaelic people were what is known as the Celtic people. It is said that the Gallic people were so called because of their red hair, Gala meaning rooster. I'm not sure about this, but it would distract from the topic to go into the linguistic roots of the word. In my view, the Galatians inhabiting Turkey were also Celts, hence the word Gal. The German people were a mix of Celts, Gauls and other tribes. The Galatians, Gallic Celts, and Chaldeans, Celts, are also featured in the Bible. This genetic map is revealing. It shows that the red-haired and blonde Celtic and Gallic people likely came from the west, the Atlantic Ocean, first landing in western France, Gallia and Ireland, then in Wales, England, Belgium and the Netherlands. The more they moved east, the more diluted their genes became, through mixing with already existing tribes. Hence in Greek, Keltoi refers to the ones that arrived. I first pointed to these genetic facts in my work on Atlantis, 10 years ago. If Atlantis existed as an advanced country in the Atlantic Ocean, then, its sinking through a cataclysm would have driven survivors to Europe. The genetic map of Europe doesn't really support the idea of a Roman Empire invading and conquering Europe. It supports the idea of an Atlantean Empire invading and conquering Europe. The Excavation of Rome Excavations in Rome, Italy, were ongoing between the 1800s to the 1940s. The structures excavated were labeled Rome, but we find the same structures in the expositions in America, in the Middle East, in Russia, and other places where the Roman Empire was not. If the Roman Empire was destroyed before the year 500, why did they only start excavating the city in the 1800s? This doesn't make any sense at all. Why was Mussolini excavating Roman buildings in the 1940s? Shouldn't that have already started 1000 years prior? Many of the buildings were 20 to 30 feet underground. How did that happen? Was the so-called Roman Empire, in fact the global empire called Atlantis by some, and Tartaria by others? And, was it destroyed and flooded in a cataclysmic event, or a series of events? As I've shown elsewhere on this channel, it is possible that the expositions of America in the 1800s were not newly built, but excavated from the old sunken empire. This then, was not the Roman Empire, not even the Celtic Empire, but a worldwide empire that spoke a common language and shared a similar architecture. If you input any random country in the world along with Roman coins to a search engine, you are likely to find something. The first examples I got when doing this was 1,000-year-old Roman coins found in Australia Mary Wright history. Treasure hunter finds ancient Roman coin in Australia. How did these Roman coins end up in Japan? Roman coins uncovered in Hawaii. Roman coins discovered underwater in New Mexico. Roman coins can be found worldwide. Roman architecture can also be found worldwide, but it's only called Roman when it's dug up in Europe, because the narrative insists it was only there. If you dig up pillared structures anywhere else, they aren't called Roman, because as everyone knows the Romans only existed in Europe. Can you see the circular logic? If this video provided food for thought, please share it. Knowledge dissemination relies on you. Share this video far and wide.